quick video and um, then we'll get into the introduction. So next slide, please. We're back. Um, I want to say, I will say that thanks to our IT department for the impressive video there. Uh, it's also probably the most exciting that our webinar is going to be today, but we will uh, share quite a bit of information still with you. And I think we're, uh, we'll help everybody hopefully stay safe. I hope everybody is staying safe with uh, the coronavirus and social distancing and everything we need to be doing and, um, and taking the time to join in with us today on the webinar. Um, we have attendees uh, from these, from all aspects, um, including HOAs and business owners and commercial properties, potentially hotels, as well as personal residences. So um, we've we've kind of tailored that to to talk a little bit about each of those and um, and hopefully provide some information today uh, to help keep everybody safe. So uh, and and prepared. So a little bit about us. My name's Travis Borden. Um, I've got extensive claims in construction related experience. Um, been with Venture for, uh, for several years now, and I'm currently the director of all of our commercial accounts. Um, we've also got with us Derek Shanton, who's our director of customer relations. Again, has got uh, multiple experience in the uh, construction and insurance industry. Um, we won't bore you with too many details on us, but we'll tell you a little bit um, about Venture and, uh, and what we do. So next slide, please. All right, so Derek and I are both with Venture Construction Group of Florida. We are a full service uh, property restoration and general contractor. We serve the entire state of Florida and the Caribbean. Um, we've got proven met methods and infrastructure to limit business interruption, help control costs, maintain an OSHA safe working environment, and fully restore commercial properties to their pre-storm conditions. So um, that's kind of our experience in the industry. We specialize in um, all general, construction, con uh, general contracting work as well as uh, restoration and um, and have extensive experience dealing with hurricane, tornado, and flood damage and what's uh, what needs to be done to prepare for that. Uh, and then also obviously how to, uh, how to restore it. So um, we're gonna uh, get into a little bit. We've broken our, our uh, presentation down into, into a few sections. So uh, I'll kind of briefly go through these, the, the eight steps to prepare for a hurricane. Um, the next slide will kind of break these down <clears throat> into, uh, into what we'll talk about today. So first and foremost, we're going to break down determining your risks. Um, after that, how to develop an evacuation plan, how to then create a disaster plan, um, assemble emergency supplies and create a checklist, knowing your insurance plan, and then to that, um, a couple tips on how to prepare your property how to help your residents or your tenants or your employees um, plan ahead, depending on um, what capacity you may be affected by. Um, and, and then lastly, how to download local and uh, national weather alerts. So we're going to break this down uh, into the steps. And I do want to state that we, um, if you do have any questions, we'll save those to the end. There's a chat feature on the webinar where you can type in any of your questions and then um, those will pop up to us and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation. So. Um, Thanks again, we'll move forward and uh, Derek will talk about uh, determining your risks. Thanks, Travis. Um, so step one is factoring and determining your risks. Um, obviously, like Travis said, we're dealing with HOAs, condos, business owners, hotels, residences. So everyone is in different locations. Some people could be on the beach. Some people could be on the intercoastal. You could be by a lake. So there's a lot of different determinations in looking at your risk. While it's true that some communities may be more affected by natural disasters than others, no association or business is exempt from the threat of type of disaster. Consider possibility of disasters your association or business could be faced with. And naming the ones I just named, you got flooding. Obviously, we're in Florida, so we get a lot of hurricanes, as everyone knows. That's why we're here today. And tornadoes. Along with talking about HOAs and condos, associations vary in size. Um, some communities could be a half a dozen. Others could be 1,500 units. Travis and I have dealt with both of them. 
um, in our experience. And obviously the risk factors depend on where you're located and how big your community is. Um, Multi-story condos and commercial businesses along the coast as well in large urban areas are at high risk for fire, internal flooding, and evacuation. So again, the size of your property, where you're located, you have to determine your risks. Next slide, please. Associations have different amenities such as marinas, clubhouses, tennis courts, pools, retention ponds that require special planning. Obviously, most, most associations, HOAs have pools. So getting all your pool deck furniture, your um, umbrellas, all that stuff, having it tied down, having it stored away. Um, marinas, you have boats. You don't want boats flying around in a tornado and or hurricane. So that's obviously risk factors that need to be taken into account. Associations have different population characteristics also. Resorts tend to have a high concentration of absentee owners, thus making communication plan essential. Some associations have higher populations of retired and senior residents. Some associations near universities may have a large student population. So you look at the two different populations. You have the retired and senior, which you have to give a lot of, of time for them to be able to move and, and be mobile to get, to get where they need to go. And then if you're dealing with college kids, which um, you know we have a lot of universities here in Florida, obviously those kids don't listen. Um, being 19, 20, 21, we know what they like to do during uh, times off. So we need to make sure we plan for those. Risk to bodily injury, personal property, structure, tenants, residents, employees, and yourself. This must be taken into account. Every homeowner association, resident, business have some exposure to disaster. Disaster plan has a potential and probability of saving lives reducing suffering and minimizing damage. Yeah, and, and there, just to chime in on that, one of the things that we all think about is, is keeping ourselves safe during the time of a disaster. So an, our initial you know, gut reaction, knee-jerk reaction is to, is to shelter in place, stay safe. How do we stay safe? The obligation that we have potentially as business owners um, or owners of commercial properties or being affiliated with homeowners associations are, how do we also keep the people safe um, that are doing the same thing that we are with collateral damage because one of the, the, the risk factors there are the collateral damage after the, the hurricane passes. So one of the things that Derek mentioned in there was I think the risk of fire or, or continual flooding after the storm and being able to assess what else am I responsible for after we, I keep myself safe. So I think if we keep that in mind, that'll help uh, through some of these next steps about developing a plan. So on to step two, um, developing an, an evacuation plan. Uh, we've got here a, a sample map that we were able to actually obtain from the city. Um, most city, municipalities, uh, counties, and the state will have already predetermined evacuation uh, zones based on your particular area of residency. So those can be extremely beneficial in helping um, develop an evacuation plan because a lot of the evacuation routes have already been pre-highlighted. So here's just a sample um, map that we were able to obtain through public information. So on to the next. So in conjunction with um, obtaining those kind of maps and, and, uh, and directions, you wanna first and foremost summarize procedures for community evacuation. So um, how is that gonna to, to play out on a, on a global scale for uh, your particular business, your particular employees, um, your, your particular guests, as well as uh, residents, depending on your, your application and, uh, and particular business. So um, what internal procedures do you have in place for that evacuation? If you don't have one, that needs to be um, evaluated and discussed um, amongst your business or your community. Uh, the second is include the evacuation route maps and directions like we showed an example of earlier. Again, that's public information and uh, can basically be dis disseminated out of your community and downloaded um, through numerous applications. Um, identify the nearest public shelter. So you may have a plan in place uh, to evacuate. Where's the nearest place to evacuate to stay safe? Um, and, and, um, and be able to, to provide that information as to, to location and distance. Um, in addition to that, we need to take appropriate measures to pre-approve authorized individuals for post-disaster access credentials and consider procedures for a resident canvas with special attention at high-risk residents. So um, this kind of applies to obviously a residential application as well as an employer-employee application who has access back into the building, whether it be residential, whether, whether it be commercial. Um, and we need to make sure that, you know, if there is 
um, security or uh, some some sort of secured access that if somebody evacuates the people that normally um, offer that access access how to how do uh, people that are still there to help be able to get in so make sure we've got contingency plans in place for that um, one of the options there is con to consider using a resident or a tenant evacuation placard that's got emergency phone numbers that can be prominently placed to inform public safety personnel that the residence has been evacuated. So that can assist first responders um, and then put you in touch with, uh, with somebody that, that is at the property if needed. Um, condominium residents and tenants in particular should consider an access waiver in the event that authorized personnel need to gain access to shut off utilities or otherwise protect the property. Talked a little bit about that on the, on the earlier slide, but one of the things that in a commercial application or in a, in a condominium or HOA application, you've got to realize that um, a lot of this collateral damage can, can, uh, can cause even more damage than the actual hurricane or traumatic event. So one of the things to keep in mind are, um, you know, if you lose power or there's a gas leak or there's some sort of uh, disruption in electrical or water, um, that all of these, if you're in a commercial business, that all of the commercial businesses that, uh, that are in that building or housed in that building, if it's a multi-use um, multi property, that they all share um, a central, you know, gas, or they sh share central electric or um, water, and we've got to be able to shut those down and shut those down and get access to shut those down, so we're preventing collateral damage to other businesses and other residences. Um, so, also encourage residents and tenants to make arrangements for pet care in the event that evacuation to a public shelter or a hotel is necessary. Don't forget pet supplies, including crates, leashes, food, and containers, plastic bags for cleanup. I, I know that. Everybody I know with uh, with any kind of pet is you know treats them just like their their family. So uh, it's not just that you would forget them, but pre prepare. You know when you're preparing some of the items we're going to talk about later in the presentation um, for food and water and those things. You also want to prepare for your for your pets. Um, and and even though it's not just evacuating with your pets, but in a traumatic event when you're in the chaos of potentially keeping yourself safe, there's the uh, the opportunity for, for pets to, to run away. So um, all of these things to kind of create contingencies for um, and be prepared will help. And, and Travis, then, we, we've yeah. seen it all over the um, the news and TV. Every time a storm hits, it seems like we always see loose pets and pets that got lost and um, were detached from their family. And it's sad. And like you said, we have a lot of, in our, in our company, we have a lot of people who own pets and they, like you said, Travis, they love their dogs or cats or whatever. So I think that's a very big point. Yeah, so we we love them and we take care of them, but we need to prepare for uh, for how to, to uh, protect them in the, in the case of emergency as well. Uh, and then lastly, we need to notify our residents and tenants of of measures to safeguard and protect um, property during the during the uh, evacuation. So, um, next slide. So the next slide, step three: create a disaster plan. So basically, you have to develop your plan and then put your plan into action, the preparation, and then you go into the recovery after the storm. So this is all like anything else. You got to plan, have the action stays, and then once a storm hits, be able to do what you got to do either during getting like the uh, evacuation plan or after the storm. Your association or commercial property disaster plan should identify procedures that will reduce loss of life and damage expenses. It should also identify procedures for post-disaster management. So again, you know, you gotta come up with a plan if it's an HOA application or a commercial application, whether you have employees or people, you have to come up with the plan and then be able to put it into motion. It is important to organize a team of individuals who will be able to contribute and participate in planning or implementation of the disaster plan. This team should include a representation of the management company if applicable and or at least one member of the board of directors in a residential capacity. So basically the HOA, if it's a, a condominium and the management company should get together and talk about the plan. And it goes back to determining the risks, putting together the plan for the risks, whether it's evacuation plan like Travis talked about, securing the building, that kind of thing. The board should also recruit residents or tenants with experience in areas such as medical, police, fire, insurance, legal, electrical, et cetera. So use your contacts, the people that, that are in the building, the people that um, are in your business. Use those contacts, come up with the plan, and um, we gotta apply it. Next, next, uh, next page. Yeah, I think one of the things too, 
most everybody's probably been in a situation where you, it's almost like a school fire drill um, or you're dealing with, if you're in a, a multi-use uh, com, uh, commercial building where you've got multiple businesses um, and same for an HOA uh, type high rise building or multi-unit community, um, you always designate kind of a, a disaster location an evacuation location. I mean, it goes back to, to kind of elementary school. You've got your your leader for the, you know, fire drill. So it's kind of the same principles on a larger scale is designate, you know, know who your assets are, know what you have uh, in your, in your community and, and in your employment or in your businesses and, um, and develop a, a team leader, someone who is organized for checking the business or checking the residents or checking the floor um, during an evacuation, somebody who you're supposed to check into after you leave um, you know, or, or get to a shelter, all those kind of things to go ahead and pre-designate those, um, those types of characteristics and, and pre-designate those types of appointments and contacts. Um, so you're prepared for it. And Travis, that goes into this right here. I can't, how many associations have you and I dealt with that had no idea what to do when a storm was coming or when a storm hit, they told us once we got there, Hey, we had no idea what to do. You know, we, we didn't know where to go, what to do. And the first person that came and knocked on our door, we just listen to. Um, and that's why it's important with this slide right here, it talks about having your plan written and approved in advance. Having that plan developed, like we said earlier, by the HOA members, by the business, whatever, um, and have it written a plan and then make sure that it's stored away in an accessible location and it's not gonna get damaged by the storm. So it could be you know, in a secure place. And periodically the plan should be reviewed and rehearsed. So it should be discussed by either the business owners, if you're a business or, or the HOA members or hotels, whatever, whatever your facility is, you need to go over that plan, like Travis said, like a fire drill and make sure you guys know the steps that everybody knows the steps that's gonna be involved. Um, your association or, or property may explore grant funding opportunities through CERT. Um, and if you don't know about CERT, you can, you can Google that and look that up. It's a program with, with financing. Um, and no, we're going to talk about insurance policies later, but know your insurance policy and what you're going to need and the steps when that comes up. So yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about the CERT. For those of you that may not be familiar with it, it's, a, it's either state run or city run or county run, depending on where you are. Um, and it's, it's usually implemented by first responders. So it's, it's basically a community emergency response training. So most fire departments, military and police departments implement all of their all of their staff to go through the CERT training. So it basically helps designate on what to do for your community. And people with CERT training are usually tasked with search and rescue just by having the CERT training. So um, it's, it's usually free or it's a nominal cost depending on who's offering the training, but it's extremely beneficial to at least have some member of your, um, of your, your building maintenance or your, your building management or your employment or, or HOA to go through this because um, it's a huge asset on what to do in disaster response and how to train for it. So um, I definitely recommend that somebody be designated to look into that program from, from your uh, business or residence. Next slide. Assessing disaster risks, potential disaster risks and potential impacts. Um, summarize the past disaster experiences. So think about what's happened in the past to your facility or in the area or even other people and come up with those things. The recovery is, is very important. Obviously you have different stages of the recovery. Um, sometimes you have to evacuate, you're not even there and you have to come back to, to a, a whole mess like, like the picture that's behind this, um, behind this slide. So the, the biggest thing is to stay calm um, and, you know, and stay calm and follow the plan that you had written out. That's why it's very important to have a pre-plan. Secure the area is the second piece. And again, if you look at behind this slide, how bad that place is, who knows what, you, what, a, what your facility will look like, whether a hurricane comes through or a tornado, and you got to secure the area for not only safety for yourselves and the people that are there, but also the building. Provide first aid when needed. Follow instructions of local authorities. Obviously, a lot of roads get cut off. A lot of different things happen, um, and you may not even be able to be at your facility for a few weeks. Briefly assess damage, obtain documentation, and protect property. So 
the briefly assessed damage obtained documentation is very important. And Travis is going to touch on this in, in a few more slides. But basically, you want to have pre and post pictures. You want to have a lot of documentation of before, what your facility or property looked like before the hurricane, and what it looked like exactly afterwards, and, and how much damage was done. And this will help when, when, you're, when you're talking with the insurance company and when the insurance adjusters are looking at what's going on um, and basically your property, your list of things that were in the property also. Some people do videotapes, uh, videotapes, videos, they do pictures of their contents within the property. So it's very important to obtain the documentation for that. Next slide. Planning a budget financial plan. Summarize the budget and finances that will be used to satisfy disaster expenses. Basically, you got a budget, just like you budget for putting a new roof on without a disaster, or you budget for new windows, or you budget for landscaping. You have to put a budget aside for a disaster. I know it's hard to know exactly how much things will cost, but you got to put a budget aside for that for tarping the building if your roof gets pulled, uh, some of the shingles get pulled off after a storm, um, and you know anything like that, a window blows out, things like that. Funding pre-disaster supplies and equipment. Again, uh, we have a, a list of, uh, that Travis will go over here in a minute, of, of supplies you'll need, and so the funding for that. Insurance deductibles, it's important to know your deductible. What, what are you gonna need if, you're, if your building does have damage and the deductible you have to pay to get that, that work completed? Uninsured losses, debris removal. Obviously, again, you can see behind this picture with all the debris there, that can be very expensive. Demolition and other emergency expenditures. Next slide. All right, so Derek kind of introduced this, but in this next step, step four, so we're halfway there, yay. Um, assemble emergency supplies and create a checklist. Um, a lot of these things are, are somewhat uh, you know, self-explainable, but uh, you know, some of them aren't. So we'll talk a little bit about, we'll just kind of run through this, um, this kind of bullet point list of emergency supplies you may need. Uh, first aid supplies, uh, rope and chain, um, that could be used for some of the debris we talked about earlier. You, you know, you think about water damage and wind damage, but a lot of uh, times you have access issues. So rope and chain that can help to uh, tow or remove debris or vehicles. Um, ladders, utility knives, duct tape, sheet plastic, which is tarps and blankets, uh, radios, flashlights, batteries, flares, bottled water, poster board, and markers for signs, basic tools such as tape measures, hammers, nails, drills, wenches, hacksaws, and shovels, uh, any kind of ratcheting tie-down straps, ch chainsaws and handsaws, plywood and portable sawhorses, portable generators, pumps if you have any type of flooding issue to get the water out, fans or smoke, ventilation equipment, fuel and approved storage containers, a bullhorn um, with a battery and an audio, auto cigarette adapter if possible. So uh, one of the things we talked about before is um, two is one and one is none. That's kind of the moniker that uh, that a lot of people use in, the, in these types of emergency situations. So and it's going to be inevitable that if you have one set of batteries that they're going to die out and, and, and nothing's going to work. So anything you have with that could potentially be charged uh, is, is going to be beneficial to you here. A portable searchlight, battery, again, with an with a adapter or some type of charging mechanism. Uh, cameras for documenting post-disaster damage. Uh, digital cameras obviously permit quick downloads and emailing. And then auto cigarette lighter adapters for mobile phones and laptop com computers. So which, these are, whether you're in a residential capacity or a commercial business capacity or a hotel business where you've got uh, potentially even patrons there. Um, these are obviously priority items that you need to always have on on hand. And uh, I, it is important to note that um, there is actually a tax-free weekend coming up. I believe it's uh, the end of the month, May 29th through June 4th. And it specifically applies to any of these emergency supplies coming up with the onset of hurricane season. So it's a great time to go ahead and maybe pick up some of these things because I believe the tax-free benefits apply to specifically batteries and flashlights and um, and possibly even generators. So, um, so it may be a good time to go ahead and pick up some of these items if, if you don't have them on hand. You know, um, you know, it's interesting, Travis, that generator point. I think you and I've seen a, a few people, a few HOAs that have gotten 
some generators so that they put them in their clubhouses. So after a storm, when, when everybody else is out, they have a, a meeting place that they can meet and a, a place that has electricity um, and they can go over there and they can, they can talk about their plans and how the recovery plans. So the generators is one that always sticks out to me, uh, whether you're a residence or an HOA or a business owner. Yeah, good point. We've got a couple samples here of uh, just what some of uh, the checklists look like that we've put together. Um, obviously, this is you know not in a format that you'd be able to use. So please feel free to contact us afterwards uh, for a downloadable checklist that could possibly be edited or tailored to your specific application. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea here of some of the things that you want to um, to have uh, on hand ahead of time. All right, next slide. Know your insurance plan. Insurance audit. Meet with your insurance agent at least annually and review risk, coverage, deductibles, resident responsibilities, and procedures for loss reporting. This is super important. A lot of people, they go sign up with their agent, they pay their premium every year, and they don't pay attention to their policy. And this, this again, is, is very important. You have to review what your policy covers, what it covers from a windstorm, what it covers from hail, what it covers from a named hurricane. Um, that's very important. Knowing your deductible. You don't want to be surprised if you, you think your deductible is 500000 for a condominium and it's $3 million. You, you want to know your deductible. So again, like we talked about earlier, you can plan um, for the financial piece of it. The other piece is if you're an HOA, a condo application, the resident responsibilities. What are the residents responsible for? We know that uh, most condos, when a storm hits, that the HOA is responsible for the exterior of the buildings and all the way up to the drywall and the residents are the paint in, meaning the flooring, their furniture, that kind of thing. So you have to know your insurance plan. Um, safeguarding of important documents. This may include governing documents such as articles of incorporation, bylaws, resolutions, insurance policies, bank account numbers, statements, checks, et cetera. All your documents that you have, this is very important to have it safeguarded. Have it, have it put away um, in a safe place. You may want to have it put away in a couple different areas. Uh, some, if you have it in the cloud, that's great. But you want to put it at, if, you have, if there's some of it, you have to put it different people's places or locations or, or however you want to have all this on hand when something does happen so you're able to reference it. But knowing your insurance plan is, is, is very, very important. Next, yeah, next. Uh, just to just to kind of chime in on that, when you're talking about, you know, Derek and I have worked, you know, we're, we're not adjusters. So we don't, uh, we don't basically, uh, you know, tell you how to, to deal with your insurance, but we inherently deal with insurance um, all the time when we're dealing with these kind of disasters. And I will tell you from experience that it's, it, there's no question that the HOAs and the businesses and the residences that we've seen that have, been approved the fastest to be able to start restoration work are the ones that typically are the most organized with the management of their doc documentation ahead of time. So, it, you know, I've seen businesses, commercial properties that we've gone into. Um, unfortunately, you know, they were, they had significant damage post hurricane, but they had, they had meticulous record keeping uh, in regards to all of their maintenance all of their upkeep, everything with every receipt that had been done to that property, um, all of the documentation ahead of time so that they knew what their insurance required. So at the time when they contacted the insurance to come and basically investigate their claim, they provided a huge binder with all of the documentation that would ever be asked for, which just expedited the, the insurance claim and, and benefit to them to be able to restore the property. So can't stress enough how important the documentation is on this. All right, so moving on to preparing your property. Um, just as important as the documentation and the paperwork and the receipts and maintenance, um, keeping the photographic evidence of the property uh, is just as important. So Derek touched on it a little bit earlier, but we're talking about photo and video documentation of your property uh, prior to any type of uh, potential uh, damage or, or major event. So what that means is, um, you know, taking, taking photos periodically throughout the year. If you upgrade a clubhouse or you update your, let's, if you manage or own a hotel, if you update the uh, rec, rec area or whatever it is, then obtain documentation of what that looks like uh, 
prior to any kind of storm. That way, you know, you're, you're covered on, on uh, assets and, um, and, and all of your, you know, your different type of equipment and uh, miscellaneous type things that are, that are inside your residence or your business. So and Travis, uh, that just came up today with us. We had a question about a, a, a roofing piece from 2017. Remember, we had documented it, and um, they asked for that. That they asked if we still have those pictures, and we stole the pictures from 2017. Yeah, yeah, and those things it ends up being being a huge asset. So, um, and Derek mentioned again too, keep copies in remote and secure locations. So, it it would be great to to get all of your documentation together, and all of your photographic documentation, and all your records together. But unfortunately, a lot of people just keep them stored in their place of business or their place of residence that is also affected by the storm. So if you have a, a major event and your business or your residence floods and all of your documentation is in there, then everything you did was for naught. So you need to make sure that, like Derek said, in a cloud, keep that in a remote location, um, a secured you know, storm and fire safe box, along with, with a, maybe a family member or, or a business associate that's out of state. Um, a copy online or a copy, a physical copy with somebody that's out of the area um, will assist. I know many people that have been around um, dealing with the storm since the eighties, back before we had all these, the digital technology, a lot of insurance companies will tell you back then to document with a VHS recorder and walk through your home and then mail a copy of that VHS tape to your f friends and family out of state. So it's still a good idea. And that same application still applies uh, just with the digital formats in the cloud. We have a little bit, easier access to do so. So um, in conjunction with that documentation, you want to take a physical inventory um, of what you got. And we mentioned that a little bit briefly, but uh, summarize your clubhouse, pool, tennis, courts, um, equipment records. Uh, if you do, you should include the brand and the model, the serial number, the date it was purchased, as, as well as receipts, um, drawing schematics, photos. If you had something redone, let's like you did have uh, at your business, you had a, an addition put on or at your your residential location had a had a, an addition put on. Keep the, the blueprints and the plans and the receipts and the invoices. All of those things will help. Um, keep a record in, and map the location of cutoff valves and switches, especially for things like water, gas, electric, sprinklers, and alarms. Um, and record anything that uh, is going to require a key code or a combination lock access. So you've got that way to disseminate that to, to somebody else uh, that's out of the area if need be, or to somebody outside of your organization if need be. Um, other considerations that we briefly mentioned earlier, are special IDs and placards for volunteers or authorized decision makers, um, dead tree and limb risk to power lines, street access, buildings and vehicles. Um, we talked a, a little bit about that, but a lot of times the collateral damage and a lot of the major damage is caused by flying debris or tree limbs or down trees. Um, so, and those risks can occur for hours or even days after the storm because they've been uh, they've been damaged and then a tree will end up falling three days later. We've seen that happen before. Um, so those are the kind of things to think about when you're uh, working on your preparation. Um, and then vendors and contractors. So pre-qualify them, no matter who your general contractor is, um, beware of the risks of subcontractors with unskilled labor, without insurance, without licensure. Uh, the insurance may not cover if procedures are not followed. And especially in a state like Florida, um, where there's such stringent requirements for general contractors and roofers and tradesmen, um, we find unfortunately that in this industry, when you are dealing with a, a catastrophe or a major event like this, that people come out of the woodworks and, and they, they come from out of the area and look, you know, Derek and I've got several properties we got involved with that prior to our involvement, um, we found out that they were paying, Thirty and forty thousand dollars for a guy in a truck to come tarp the building because it was leaking, and he just happened to be there. Um, again, if they're not licensed and there's price gouging involved, there's no there's no guarantee that uh, the insurance will help uh, recover those emergency services. So one of the things that's important is to is to know who you're working with and and somebody that that understands how to um, handle this type of work. So you know, and uh, Travis, think of the horror stories too that we've heard about people signing up. People just stopped by to do cleanup or emergency service work. They weren't licensed, weren't insured. And the horror stories we've heard of that, of people breaking things or, you know, theft. you know, theft. A lot, we had a lot of theft that we knew about people going in people's units to clean up drywall and things were missing. So it is very important that is to pre-qualify whoever you use, the vendors or contractors, that's for sure. Yeah, next slide. 
couple of things to use to pre-qualify your contractors. Um, obviously, the main thing, any particular layman will usually look for, for insurance coverage. So workers' compensation coverage in addition to liability insurance. So the important thing to note there is that liability, if somebody comes in to, um, to start removing debris or cut down trees around your business or around your residence and they don't have liability insurance and then that tree falls and now causes additional damage, um, I can guarantee you from working with insurance, they're in the business of saving money. If they're going to call what's, sub, what's called subrogation um, and they're going to find fault with anybody else that potentially caused damage there. So um, if there's somebody else that, uh, that impacted the damage that occurred, even though it was hit by a hurricane, um, they could be responsible for collateral damage that occurred from, from uh, faulty, faulty workmanship. So making sure that they're covered by liability is, is important and to make sure that that's periodically kept up to date and, and checked up on. Just because somebody gives you a certificate doesn't mean you shouldn't uh, qualify that. And, and make sure it's accurate and up to date. Um, licensed home improvement contractor, like I said, Florida is extremely stringent on licensing requirements. All of that is public information. So you can go online through the state of Florida and you can confirm the licensing information for any licensed contractor. So we recommend that you do that. Make sure whoever you do work with, uh, whether it be a general contractor or a tradesman or a subcontractor is providing written estimates and warranties um, making sure they're providing current customer references um, and make sure they're affiliated with leading accreditations, memberships, and certifications in the industry. Uh, if there's not, there's typically a reason why there's not. And, and it's probably that they're not investing in themselves or their trades. So, um, you know, just like with any other business, con contracting and construction, those things change all the time. Code requirements change all the time. Making sure somebody is keeping up to date with what the requirements are is extremely important. Um, and making sure they're OSHA certified. Obviously, OSHA is safety requirements nationally, uh, actually, uh, and then HAG certified, which HAG is a certification. It's extremely important for uh, restoration work and, um, and train additional training. So something else to look for. All right, next slide. All right, so we talked, we've talked a lot about photographic documentation. So we've got some examples here of <clears throat> what can be done pre-storm and post-storm. Um, obviously, with the advancements in technology, we've had a, um, a huge influx of, of opportunities for impressive videotape documentation. We've got high resolution, full scope, 4K, HD, uh, 3D drone photos with mapping and Matterport. Um, I think everybody's probably seen some drone footage, but uh, it's really taken off in the field of uh, general contracting and insurance. And we've got some videos here that show some of our recent uh, drone footage of projects. Uh, the Matterport is, is something that you may not be as familiar with. And again, we've got some footage going of a Matterport. Um, keep in mind that this is a, it's a video clip of us using the program. So this is a, a very interactive where you actually touch screen through the video screen to walk through the Matterport. It's done with a series of cameras and it takes an actual, obviously, as you can see here, a real life view. It creates a whole dollhouse effect of the entire structure as well as internal um, footage that you can walk through um, and really get, you know, real-time uh, documentation of what was going on in this particular structure prior to the storm. And then again, compared to what was going on in the structure after the storm. So this has been a, a very significant tool um, in the restoration industry uh, that we can provide um, prior to and, and also following uh, any type of traumatic event. So uh, again, just a couple examples of of where the technology is going with this. So the next step, step seven, we're getting close to being done. Step seven, help your residents, tenants plan ahead. <clears throat> inform, inform residents, tenants of the association's communication plan and steps that will be followed to keep residents and tenants informed. So this goes back to the planning that we talked about the disaster plan and um, you got to inform the community. So whether you're an apartment complex, whether you're an HOA, whether you're a hotel, whatever, whatever application you are, you have to communicate to the people that are on the property and let them know what the plan is. Provide an association emergency contact persons and phone numbers in the event of emergency. Also methods of identifying community disaster volunteers. So make sure the community, the residents, have the proper emergency numbers for everyone involved in the community. Encourage residents, tenants to have a plan to fuel vehicles in advance. Obviously, 
it's important to have your cars and your vehicles ready to go in case you have to leave at the, the drop of a dime. Be sure to park vehicles in safe areas, falling trees and limbs and flooding caused over $40 million in damage. So obviously on where your site is to make sure if the storm is coming to park where a tree is not gonna fall on your car, then you won't be able to evacuate. That's important. Encourage res residents and tenants to report post-disaster damage and follow instructions to protect property and document damage. Now that's important going back to the whole insurance documentation because once the resident or tenant comes back, whether it's to their business, it's if it's a shopping center or it's a condo, when they get there, to inspect the property, inspect the outside, inspect, try to inspect the roof, inspect the interior, and document any and all damage. Video uh, documentation like Travis just talked about, pictures, whatever you can do to get that documented. Recommend that residents, tenants with special needs notify the Board of Disaster Planning Committee. Provide evacuation route maps and location of nearest shelters. So basically the evacuation routes that Travis talked about, make sure everyone involved, again, whether it's a hotel, a residence, HOAs, make sure that everyone has that information. Provide a checklist of evacuation procedures, such as turning off utilities and use of evacuation. Um, include emergency phone numbers also. It's very important to have that out there, whether you, shoot the, whether you, whether you send your HOAs emails or you, some, some HOAs, we've had ones that, that are older communities where people don't seem to use emails and they post everything up on a board. However you gotta do it, the information has to get to the residents. Recommend the residents' uh, tenants plan for pet care. We talked about that earlier, that's very important. Eric, I wanna chime in real quick on um, one of the things you mentioned and I think it's extremely important. I just wanna kind of share an anecdote because um, we talked about fueling vehicles and keeping gas on hand. One of the, one of the things that we've found, um, I worked out of our Atlanta office for a long time. And one of the things I saw, and everybody's probably heard about Snowmageddon, which obviously is not a hurricane, but it is still a traumatic weather event that caused extensive damage. One of the number one problems that they had with evacuation in that storm was, not to mention it was a, a total mess with the state, but the fact that people were stranded in their vehicles, which the same things happen in hurricanes for up to 14 to 18 hours. Um, and, and you're dealing in a winter event there, which, obviously it's cold. So one of the problems they had was that over 50% of the people that were on the roads ran out of gas because most people keep less than a quarter of a tank in their, in their car at all times. So one of the things that's always been a pet peeve of mine in, um, in planning ahead, but to always try to keep your vehicles full of gas and always kind of keep, try to keep gas on hand. Um, it's one of the things that we found that it, it seems pretty simple, but especially in, we've all dealt with it when you have a, a hurricane or a major event, Gas stations run out of gas. People need to try to evacuate and then they, they're closed and there's no, no way to get it. So if you can't get out of town and can't get out of the area, um, it can be detrimental. So it's one of the things that's I think a lot of, a lot of people overlook. Yeah, right. Good point. Um, on here also, it talks about absentee homeowners. Um, we have a lot of snowbirds in Florida, as, as we all know. So it's important that people have each other's numbers. Um, if you're in an association, the residents should have, they should have a number list so that people are not there can help people out. I mean, on here it mentions garbage cans, lawn furniture, broken windows. But if the people aren't able to get back, um, have someone that's a home watch person or someone that can actually look at your, your, your apartment, your condo, your business and see what's going on with it if you're unable to get there. Associations with clubhouse facilities may develop and communicate plans to use a facility for command and care center. This goes back to the generator I talked about earlier. Uh, that's pretty important for the association to have it a generator so that the clubhouse can be a safe haven that people can come and they can, they can gather and they'll have air conditioning, heat, whatever, and they can plan accordingly. Associations of marinas should advise boat owners of special requirements. We talked about the boats earlier. That's pretty important. Uh, we, we've saw that all over the Caribbean and St. Martin and other areas where boats just were piled up on each other because of these storms. So uh, planning accordingly with the boats is important. Provide a list of recommended supplies, which Travis showed earlier, and that's, that's on our website that can be forwarded to residents. And provide a list of safety tips also. So all this, it's just, it's just communication. It's just letting people know whether, again, whether you're a business owner, a hotel, or an HOA, just, just communicating all these different factors is important. Next slide.
All right, step eight, the last one. Uh, we're, we're talking about downloading local and national weather alerts. So um, we've talked about technology today and, uh, and the apps and, and uh, things that you can download here to assist. Um, so sign up for local alerts on your phone. Um, numerous ways that you can do that, um, numerous apps that you can do that. There's an extensive amount of uh, information on the web. So sign up for as, as, as much as you can or download as much as you can for um, weather alerts, um, especially being being in Florida and, and coming up on hurricane season. Um, so the, the most preparation and planning, the more you do, the better off you're going to be. Um, one of the sites here is ready.gov alerts. Um, you can go to that site and learn how to search for local alerts and weather apps that are relevant for hazards that affect your particular area. Um, you can go to FEMA, um, which is obviously, a, it's a federal emergency management um, for disaster resources, weather alerts, and safety tips. They've got those, again, from national and and uh, regional locations. And uh, like we talked about, sign up now so you're prepared when the weather gets worse. If you're a business owner, ensure your team has all the tools and resources to protect uh, their families. Next slide. All right, so we've got, uh, we've got a, uh, an actual slide here from, from NOAA. And uh, I think it's important to note that I, I believe there was actually a, a hurricane that's touched down in Carolinas even today. So we're getting active. Um, we've got NOAA, this is the predictions for, for 2020. And unfortunately for us, um, it looks like it's gonna be active. According to the, the NOAA predictions, the Atlantic hurricane season is expected uh, through NOAA, the Climate Prediction Center, um, from the National Weather Service uh, to predict a 60% chance of an above normal season and a 30% chance of a near normal season and only a 10% chance of a below normal season. So again, you know, predictions aren't an end all be all, but it is a prediction and any, any source to, to show here that, uh, that we may need to take precautions is, is, is probably a good one. So um, again, you can feel free to, uh, you can download and research any of that information on your own as well. Um, one of the things that we've talked about is, is how to um, how to actually prepare your property. So we've, we offer Adventure a free specific analysis and a property inspection because we've talked about a lot of kind of general topics and we know we're, we're speaking to, um, you know, potential residents, uh, residence owners, uh, HOA affiliates, business owners, uh, property managers even. So um, there could be specific questions and analysis that um, may come into question and we'll, we actually offer um, free specific inspections for your property or your, or your need if need be. So a um, couple bullet points there. We've got maintaining the property is important and the high number of storms in our areas leads to extensive water, wind and hail damage. We offer pre-storm inspections and assessments to ensure your property is prepared for hurricane season, tornadoes and other storm events. Um, we also offer all the post-storm inspections that we've talked about to get repairs needed quickly if, 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 uh, if need be. Uh, if property damage is found, we'll assign a venture uh, representative uh, who handled the project and uh, from the initial inspection and assessment, and uh, we ensure a complete and final assessment of damages and complete scope of work, and uh, operational excellence is, is our mission on every project we undertake. So um, customer service is big on us, communication, obviously getting this information out uh, to the community and helping the community is, is a big factor. So. Um, we did have a, a chat question already come through and it's relevant to this that uh, how do you contact us for a, a, a specific analysis and uh, if you move on to the next slide we've got our contact information if uh, if it comes about so these are our regional offices in Florida along with our 800 number and our website so uh, if there are additional questions or just specific needs somebody you ever wanted just to talk about your specific property please feel free to contact us. We'll put you in touch with either one of our, with Derek and myself or one of our representatives in your particular area, just to answer any questions that you could have specific to your property. Um, or if uh, you feel that uh, an, another in the inspection or additional uh, look at the, at the property is needed, we'd be happy to help on, on that as well. So uh, next slide. We talked about licensing. Here's our, here's our licensing information and, um, and that was all we had to to talk about. And we've got, I'll leave it open here for another minute or so. If you've got any other questions, we had the one come through about how to contact, but um, I don't see any others. 
And like I said, you've got our contact information. If anything else comes about, um, we'll be happy to answer any specific questions you may have afterwards. So I want to thank everybody for attending today, uh, taking the time out and, um, and, and listen. I hope we're able to answer some questions or help, uh, help you prepare. And uh, we appreciate your time. All right. Thanks, everyone. You actually have one question here. Let me see. Uh, that was that was the same one. I appreciate it. All right, thank you guys. Thanks, guys.